This lecture will be an introduction to alcohols. We'll start by looking at their structure and how to name them, and then we'll look at one chemical reaction that they're capable of doing. We'll look at other alcohol chemical reactions in later lectures. The alcohol functional group is actually relatively simple because it's comprised of just two atoms, an oxygen and a hydrogen. In the alcohol functional group, the oxygen is bonded on one side to a hydrogen and on the other to a carbon chain. I'm going to use the capital R to indicate that that carbon chain can vary. It could be a methyl, an ethyl, or something more complex. Notice also that the oxygen has two electron pairs. That means that ge the geometry around this oxygen is what we refer to as bent geometry. And because it has a total of four charge clouds, or four areas of electron density, it actually shares a very similar bond angle to what we've seen with tetrahedral carbon. The bond angle is about 109.5 degrees. Despite this, many times we condense the alcohol functional group and simply write OH, connecting that to whatever carbon group is also present. One of the major differences between molecules that have the alcohol functional group and molecules that are only alkanes or alkenes, as we've seen previously, is that the oxygen that's present in alcohol can make the entire molecule that contains it polar. And that means many alcohols are actually polar molecules. Perhaps even more significantly, the alcohol functional group is capable of hydrogen bonding. That will drastically change some of the physical and chemical properties that we'll be discussing when we think back to what we've seen with simpler hydrocarbons such as alkanes and alkenes. For one thing, even the simplest alcohols tend to be liquid at room temperature. So if we think back to alkanes like methane and ethane, those very simple alkanes were gas at room temperature. In alcohols, alcohols such as methanol and ethanol, which we'll talk about in a moment, because they have hydrogen bonding, each alcohol molecule is strongly attracted to other alcohol molecules. The consequence is that simple alcohols tend to be liquids at room temperature. One thing that we will have to consider, however, is that there's a great deal of variability between what the R group is on an alcohol. So we might be dealing with an R group that has just one carbon, or we might be dealing with an R group that has dozens. As a result, there's a little bit of variability in how alcohols behave. And that variability often depends on how many carbons are present. An alcohol that has a very small R group, perhaps just one or two carbons, will tend to have properties that are more like what we think of for aqueous solutions, more water-like properties because the OH itself is very similar to what we find on the water molecule. However, if we start to expand that R group to have more and more carbons, at some point the carbon chain wins out as far as the properties go, and we have a more alkane-like molecule that will have alkane-like properties. This will have a very significant effect when it comes to things like solubility. Whether or not an alcohol is soluble in water actually depends on what exactly the R group is. For relatively simple alcohols, we usually put the dividing line between these water-like molecules and alkane-like molecules at about five carbons. So we'll see that the alcohols that have just one, two, three, four, or potentially five carbons will be soluble in water whereas those that have more than five carbons will tend to be insoluble in water. And of course, there's some gray area there. Depending on the exact geometry of the molecule, as well as the presence of other functional groups, it affects exactly where we draw that line. Let's talk about some common alcohols that you might run into in our lab or in your day-to-day -day life. The simplest alcohol out there contains just one carbon and it's what's called methanol. It's essentially a methyl group directly connected to the OH functional group. For that reason, you may occasionally also heard it referred to as methyl alcohol, although methanol is the preferred IUPAC term. Historically, the substance was also called wood alcohol because it could be prepared through a process that involved burning wood. In our modern era, one of the most common uses of methanol is as a solvent in industrial chemistry. 
it's an especially effective solvent because a wide range of different compounds will dissolve in methanol. That's partly because it contains both carbon as well as the OH group, which is capable of hydrogen bonding. Even if you don't run into methanol in a chemistry setting, you're actually exposed to very, very small amounts of it in many things that we eat and drink. Sometimes it's present due to natural processes. Sometimes it's present because of the way the food is produced. This can be problematic, however, if there's larger amounts of methanol present in anything we consume because methanol is toxic. In fact, in its concentrated pure form, methanol is extremely toxic in some very tangible ways. Drinking just 10 milliliters of methanol can cause blindness in humans, and 100 milliliters can actually cause death. If you've ever heard about people going blind because they consumed moonshine, that's because during the Prohibition era in the United States, many people producing illegal beverages would add methanol, basically because it was a cheaper form of alcohol. The consequence is that some people suffered some pretty nasty health effects because they were unknowingly consuming large amounts of methanol. Speaking of drinking alcohol, let's talk about ethanol. Ethanol is a two-carbon alcohol, so because it's essentially an ethyl group connected to the OH group, it can also be referred to as ethyl alcohol. This, however, is also the alcohol that most people refer to when we talk about alcoholic beverages. Because many alcoholic beverages are prepared by fermenting grain, that has also given ethanol the common name of grain alcohol. It's a little bit of a misnomer, however, because there's many other substances, from grapes to barley to potatoes, that can be fermented to produce alcohol. Ethanol is actually used in a wide range of places. It can be used as a solvent, and we actually see it these days being used more and more as a fuel additive. Of course, it's impossible to talk about ethanol without mentioning that ethanol is the alcohol in adult beverages that are known as alcoholic beverages. The reason for this is that ethanol naturally forms whenever we ferment something. And we can ferment just about anything that contains sugar or carbohydrates. So alcoholic beverages have been around for thousands of years. In fact, there's some really interesting history around them. However, we sort of take alcoholic beverages for granted in this day and age, and we forget that ethanol is fundamentally toxic to humans. There's a lot of ways that ethanol is bad for us, We'll save those till later on in this unit, but trust me, we'll talk about them. Just a couple other common alcohols you might run into. I want to mention isopropanol, which is also known as isopropyl alcohol. Again, it's basically an OH group connected to the isopropyl group. We'll see momentarily that its IUPAC name is propane 2 all, but isopropanol is used in a wide range of settings. I bring it up now because most people are very familiar with it as a disinfectant, but it's also used as an additive in a lot of different processes as well as a solvent. I also want to mention phenol, and it is pronounced phenol. Phenol is what happens when you take a benzene ring and you directly bond it to the alcohol functional group. It's really important when it comes to synthesizing plastics and polymers because many polymers, including the polymer that we know as styrofoam, include that benzene structure on the ring. Finally, I want to point out that you may run into the term glycol in your day-to-day -day life, especially in substances such as ethylene glycol. In this case, glycol actually refers to an alcohol, but an alcohol that contains two separate OH groups. Glycol is an old common term. It's not the accepted IUPAC nomenclature, which, as we'll see in a couple minutes, is diol. Similar to what we've seen before, alcohols can be classified as primary, secondary, or tertiary. And the reason this works is that we already know carbons are classified as primary, secondary, or tertiary, and an alcohol group can be connected to one of those types of carbons. So when we talk about a primary alcohol, a secondary alcohol, or a tertiary alcohol, we're actually indicating the number of carbon on the carbon that's connected to the OH group. Because the OH group itself can only be directly connected to just one carbon. So when we draw an alcohol connected to a carbon, what that carbon itself is, primary, 
secondary, or tertiary. It's how we dictate whether we're looking at a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol. For instance, if I draw a carbon chain like this and connect an alcohol to this carbon, that carbon itself is connected to two other carbon directly. So we would call this a secondary carbon, and in turn, the alcohol that's attached to it would be a secondary alcohol. The reason I mention this is that whether an alcohol is primary, secondary, or tertiary has a dramatic effect on its reactivity. And that's another one of those topics that we're probably not going to get into in this class. But if you were to go on to a more advanced study of organic chemistry, you would definitely run into it. Let's talk now about how to name alcohols using IUPAC nomenclature. This really should be fairly straightforward because alcohols follow almost the exact same rules as alkenes in naming. The only difference, of course, is that now we have a new suffix. The alcohol suffix is OL, hence the reason we have names like methanol, ethanol, and so on. We usually take whatever the name of the alkane is, something like methane, and replace the E with an OL to make methanol, ethanol, and so on. For alcohols that have more complex structures, the rules are still very similar. When dealing with straight or branched chains, you'll start by finding the longest chain that the OH group is attached to. Make sure the OH group is attached to your backbone, just the same way that we made sure our alkene double bond was part of the backbone. Once you've done that, go ahead and number that backbone chain. We want to find out where the positions are for the OH as well as any other substituents that are present. The alcohol functional group will get priority over every other type of substituent we've talked about to date. So if you have a methyl, an ethyl, an isopropyl, and an alcohol, work to get the OH to the lowest number possible first. Then you'll write the name using that OL suffix. Let's try a couple examples. Take a second, pause the video, and name this molecule. First I want to start by finding my longest chain on which the alcohol is actually attached. I think the easiest thing to do is just go straight across, although if you skipped this carbon and went to that one, it wouldn't change your final name. Now that I have that backbone, I see that I have an OH group and a methyl group as substituents the OH will get priority. So as I go to number this chain, I want to make sure that's at the lowest number possible. The way to do that is to start on the right-hand side of the molecule and have carbon 1, 2, 3, and 4. Already I know that I'm dealing with butanol. My alcohol group is on the second carbon, and I have a methyl group on the third carbon. Now I get to put the name together. Just like with alkenes, there are two different ways that I'll accept for full credit to write this molecule. Here's the one that I prefer and the one that's also most commonly used in modern IUPAC systems. The way I'd name this molecule is by first writing out what my substituent is. I have a 3-methyl, then recognizing that this is going to be a butanol. When I do the name, however, I want to designate where the location of the alcohol is. So I'm actually going to use a dash, the same way that I did when I was naming alkenes. Therefore, I would call this 3-methyl-butane-2-ol. Again, the downside to this is that it doesn't roll off your tongue that easily. But the upside is there's absolutely no way someone can get confused as to why there's a 2 in the name because the 2 is directly next to the OL, indicating it refers to an alcohol. Your other option is the way that your book continues to write these. That would be by writing 3-methyl and then putting the 2 out in front of the word butanol. This is rarely done in actual scientific literature because of the potential for confusion about what is actually being referred to by the two. Having said that, I would take either one of these as full credit. Let's try another one. To name this molecule, again, I need to find my longest carbon chain and then decide what my substituents are and where they're located. Here's my OH group. The first carbon it's attached to is right there. So to get the longest chain possible, this is how I'll want to number my chain. 
Because I want to get the lowest number for the alcohol, this will be carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. That gives me a 2-methyl as well as the alcohol group. That means when I put the name together, I have two choices. One way is to call this 2-methyl, and then because it has a pent or pentanol, I'll call this pentane 1 all because the alcohol is located on the first carbon. The alternative is to call it 2-methyl-1-pentanol, and that's what your book would choose to do. Either one is completely acceptable. Let's just take a second to do an example of a diol, or an alcohol that actually has more than one alcohol functional group. We'll name these in a similar way to how we handled carbon-carbon double bonds. We said that one carbon-carbon double bond made something an alkene with an ene ending, but then we said if there were multiple bonds, you might have a diene or a triene. Well, similar to the alkenes, we'll deal with the alcohols. So it's possible to have a diol or a triol, or you could even go further than that. But we'll try to keep things relatively simple. You do need to specify the location of each one, and we do that using numbers separated by a comma. And again, there's two correct answers. So here's a molecule that has two OH functional groups. Take a second, pause the video, and see if you can name it. To name this molecule, I want to start by determining what my backbone is. And I want to make sure that both OH groups are touching the backbone. So I'll choose my backbone to go this way. You could also have gone up on that far left side. When I number, I want to get the lowest numbers possible, and I give the OH groups the priority. So for that reason, I'm going to number from the right side, because the left side would put them at higher numbers. This means I have an alcohol on my second carbon and my third carbon, as well as a methyl group on the fourth carbon. To write the name out, I have two options. One is to call this 4-methyl, and because there's five carbons, I'll call this pentane, 2, 3, diol. I'm using a number for each location of an alcohol as well as the prefix di to indicate that there's two alcohols. Similarly, you could reverse the order of this the way your textbook tends to do and call this 4-methyl 2,3-pentane diol. Either one is completely acceptable. Finally, let's just do a couple examples of naming cyclic alcohols. Again, these will be very similar to the rules we looked at with cyclic alkenes. Remember that just as with alkenes, now we're going to say that alcohols get priority in both numbering and in position. That means that the alcohol's position will always be implied as position number one. We don't need to designate it in any circumstance, although if we have more than one substituent, we may have to use it for clarity. So try these examples. I never get tired of putting up squares and having students that understand they're not just squares, they're an example of cyclobutanol. So this particular molecule, if it didn't have the OH, would be cyclobutane, so we'll call this cyclobutanol. Don't forget the cyclo prefix, it's very easy to leave it out by accident. I don't need any number because the OH is just on the ring and I don't have to specify its position. Now try this one. This molecule has five carbons in a ring, so if it had no substituents, it would be cyclopentane. However, it does have the alcohol substituent, making it a cyclopentanol. We get to assume that the pentanol, or the OL part, is automatically the first carbon. So then I just have to number to get the other substituent, a methyl group, in the lowest number possible. The easiest way to do that is going counterclockwise, and that means that my methyl group is on the third carbon. So I would call this 3-methyl cyclopentanol. I don't need to designate that the OH is at position 1. However, to be honest, if you wrote 3-methyl cyclopent 1-all, I probably would have a hard time justify taking off points because it just makes it even more clear. But having said that, the 1 is not required. Finally, name this molecule. 
Okay, so either you got this or you didn't, because right away you should notice that this molecule is phenol. It's a benzene connected to an OH. So don't try to name it as an alkene and an alcohol, because remember, that benzene ring doesn't have any true double bonds. There's quite a few reactions that alcohols are capable of doing, and we'll focus on just two in this class. The first one, which we're going to talk about in this lecture, is a dehydration reaction. Just like the name implies, in a dehydration reaction we remove water. Unlike dehydrating a substance just by evaporating water, this is a chemical reaction. So we'll chemically remove a hydrogen atom and at the same time chemically remove an OH, thus resulting in the loss of an entire water molecule. The other type of reaction that we'll look at in our next lecture is what's called oxidation. You should have seen oxidation in general chemistry, but I can assure you that most likely the way we'll approach it in organic chemistry will look a little bit different. Basically, we think of oxidation in organic chemistry as being a reaction where we add more carbon to oxygen connections, usually by making carbon-oxygen single bonds or increasing them to carbon-oxygen double bonds. We'll save the oxidation reactions for later on and just focus on the dehydration reactions now. As I said, dehydration in any setting always refers to removing water molecules. In an alcohol, the reason that we can do a chemical dehydration is that that alcohol is bound to contain the two necessary pieces to make a water molecule. One piece is the OH and the other piece is the H. So what we'll find ourselves doing in a dehydration reaction is removing the OH group from a carbon and then stepping to the carbon directly next to it or adjacent to it to remove the other carbon. What happens as a result is that the electrons that are left over after the OH and H are removed form a carbon-carbon double bond. So you might think about the process as this. When we have two carbons that have an OH on one and a hydrogen next to it, we're able to do a dehydration reaction. I'm going to put R groups here, but again, as I've said many times before, these could be R groups or hydrogen themselves. In the dehydration reaction, we remove the OH and we remove the H. So both of those are removed, and that's essentially an inorganic product of the reaction. The remaining electrons basically close up, metaphorically speaking, in order to make a new carbon-carbon double bond. What remains attached to those carbons are the R groups or the hydrogen, whatever was initially attached. The only thing that's been lost are the OH and the H. The result of this is that we start out with something that has the alcohol functional group and we end with a molecule that now has an alkene functional group. You can't do this reaction simply by taking a molecule and putting it into an oven the way you might dehydrate food. So sometimes we write minus water on top, but that doesn't actually tell us how to do this reaction. The real reason this reaction happens is that sulfuric acid catalyzes the reaction. So we frequently write H2SO4 either above or below the arrow. Writing the H2SO4 is required because the reaction won't happen without this acid catalyst. Writing minus H2O is really optional. Even without that present, you should be able to recognize that the H2O catalyzes a dehydration reaction. However, most people appreciate seeing that minus H2O because it really does give a very quick indication of what's happening. Having said that, while I'll generally include minus H2O, you should be able to recognize this reaction whether it's there or not. Let's do an example. Let's do a chemical reaction on a molecule of cyclohexanol. In other words, six carbons connected together with an OH group coming off them. If I were to apply sulfuric acid to cyclohexanol, go ahead and draw the product that would result. I purposely gave you a line structure here to point out the fact that even if the hydrogen isn't drawn, as long as a hydrogen on an adjacent carbon is present, the reaction can proceed. 
So you may have thought about the hydrogen that's present on this carbon or the hydrogen that's present on that one. It actually doesn't make any difference because in either case, once I draw my final product, we see that it's just a cyclohexanol that turns into a cyclohexene. And it doesn't matter whether I drew that double bond on the top or in the position to the left because they have the same meaning. This molecule that we started with was cyclohexanol, an alcohol, and this molecule that we end with is cyclohexene, regardless of where we actually draw the double bond. I want to do another example that illustrates something you have to consider when doing dehydration reactions. Let's do the dehydration reaction of 2-butanol. As we do the dehydration of 2-butanol, I'm actually going to start by drawing the molecule in its expanded form. That means that each one of these carbons is going to be surrounded by four bonds. We know that the OH group is going to have to go on the second carbon, so all the remaining bonds simply have hydrogens attached to them. Of course, you could also draw this in a more condensed or aligned structure, but I want to make a point by drawing it this way. When you do the dehydration reaction by applying sulfuric acid to this molecule, go ahead and draw the structure that will result. As you worked on this, or as you continue to work on it, you may notice there is more than one final product, and it depends on this. It depends on where the hydrogen is taken from. One possibility is that the hydrogen that's removed is this one. The consequence of removing that hydrogen is that basically these two sets of electrons will form a double bond between the first and the second carbon. So the structure that I get in that case is a carbon double bonded to a carbon on the end of the molecule followed by the remainder of the molecule, the other two carbons. Again, you could draw it in many different ways. That's very different than what happens if I remove this hydrogen. Removing the hydrogen on what is essentially the third carbon causes the double bond to form between the second and the third carbon. So my structure, if I start with the double bond here, would be that I have one carbon on each side of the double bond. I happen to be drawing this in the cis conformation, but to be honest, you don't know whether it's cis or trans if you don't know how the mechanism works, so I would take either one as full credit. I happen to have drawn the cis isomer here. So here's two different possibilities, two different structures that result from the dehydration of 2-butanol. And just like we saw before, there's always a rule that tells us which one is most likely to occur. The last rule we talked about was Markovnikov's rule. Today we're going to see Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule says the molecule with the most R groups on the carbon-carbon double bond will be your major product. The reason for that, going back to the mechanism, is that the more R groups that are on the carbon-carbon double bond as it starts to form, the more it stabilizes the transition state in the mechanism. But all you have to remember is how to look at the number of R groups on your carbon-carbon double bond. Let's start with the molecule at the top of the page in red. When I look at this molecule, on the left side of the carbon-carbon double bond, I have no R groups because it's only connected to hydrogen. On the right side of the carbon-carbon double bond, I have an R group pointing up and a hydrogen pointing down. So I have one R group. That means this molecule has a total of one R group on the carbon-carbon double bond. It's what we would call a monosubstituted double bond. It's just a fancy word for saying there's only one R group on it. Now let's look at the molecule on the bottom in purple. On this carbon-carbon double bond, I have one R group on the left side, and on the right side, I also have just one R group. So I have a grand total of two R groups that are substituting my carbon-carbon double bond. Zaitsev's rule says the molecule with the most R groups on the carbon-carbon double bond will be the major product. Two is a bigger number than one. So this is my major product, and that's what I would expect you to draw if I asked you to draw the major product of this reaction. As we saw previously, this could also be referred to as a Zaitsev product, because it's the product that follows that rule. 
Let's do an example so you can get some practice applying Zaitsev's rule. Draw the major product that results in this reaction. Take your time and remember it's fine to draw both products and then decide which one will actually result. Okay, one little trick that might help you when working with line structures of these is something that is totally egregious in chemistry because I'm going to tell you something that has no actual meaning. But it helps a lot of people figure out the right answer. And that's this. Basically, if you find your OH group, you can imagine that when you pluck this OH group off the molecule, it's like the bond is going to collapse either to the left side or the right side. If you think about it in that way, you'll instantly know what your two possible structures are. And let's draw those both for practice. I'm actually going to start by drawing the backbone of the molecule without the OH group. One option, let's say this one on the left, had the double bond forming there. Now I can imagine what my second possible product is by looking at the option where it goes to the right. In this case, I would get a double bond forming here. Now I can consider which one has the highest substitution or the most R groups on the double bond. If you got stuck and you didn't get to this point, go ahead and pause the video again so you can figure it out. Okay, what I'm going to do is highlight the R groups on each double bond. On this double bond, here is a group because that is a carbon, and here's a group because that's a carbon. Everything else would have to be hydrogen. So this has a total of two R groups. Now I'm going to look at the molecule on the bottom. I find my double bond. On this side of the double bond, here's a group. On this side of the double bond, here's one group and here's another. So in this case, on the bottom example, I actually have three R groups. Here's one, here's two, and here's three. Zaitsev's rule says the major product is the one that has the most substitution. Three R groups is better than two R groups, so this will be my major product. To finish up this lecture, I just want to talk briefly about some of the names we've been hearing, especially about Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev was named after a Russian scientist named Alexander Mikhailovich Zaitsev. And as we just saw, Zaitsev's rule tells us that when we remove an OH and dehydrate a molecule, we make a double bond. It tells us which molecule is most likely to result on the basis of how substituted the double bond is. Now, think back to the other rule that we've learned that has to do with deciding what product is your major product. That rule was called Markovnikov's rule, and it was also created by a Russian scientist that lived in the eight, late 1800s. His name was Vladimir Vasilyevich Markovnikov. Here's the thing about Markovnikov's rule. It's kind of the reverse of Zaitsev's rule. It tells us when we're adding an OH or hydrating a molecule, where the OH will be added. Because remember, it dealt with the fact that you had a double bond and you had two carbons on each side of the double bond, so you had to decide where to add the OH. So Zaitsev's rule and Markovnikov's rule are really the reverse of each other. And this is kind of ironic because these two gentlemen were working for the same advisor when they were young men and went on to teach at the same college in Russia. And of course, that can only have two endings to it. They have rules that are basically the opposite of each other, the same advisor in the same college. Either, either they were going to be best friends or what happened here is they were actually bitter rivals. Markovnikov is generally known as the better scientist, not to fault Zaitsev too much, but Markovnikov worked on everything from Markovnikov's rule to our understanding of chemical structural isomers. So he did a lot of things in organic chemistry. Zaitsev, on the other hand, didn't have such a great reputation as a chemist. In fact, one of the reputations, unfortunately, that he got was for the fact that Zaitsev's rule, or the principles that underlie it, were published by another Russian scientist several years before him. He was a bitter rival of Markovnikov, and there's people that have suggested that he basically took these other scientists' work and published it because he was essentially jealous that Markovnikov was getting attention for his rule. 
and yet here they are in our little organic chemistry class sitting next to each other on the page. It's kind of ironic. But Zaitsev's rule and Markovnikov's rule basically involve whether you're removing OH or adding OH and how to do it to represent the major product. That's the end of this lecture, and our next lecture will continue looking at alcohol chemical reactions.